when you come to an anniversary, you tend to look back on things. And so when you come to the last Sunday of a year, you tend to look back, you know. It's the last Sunday of 72. And uh, some of you really have been coming for a year and some for two years. And yet I know that some of you are in the position that if I ask you, are you still afraid of what people think of you? You'd say, uh, yeah, a bit. And if I pushed you and said, do you know that if you died tonight, your creator would really accept you? You would be tempted to say, well, yeah, I think so. And if I pushed you really and said, do you really know your creator in a personal way? Many of you would say, well, yeah, I hope I do. And yet you know in your heart that even though you've listened to the stuff, you know, for one or two years, yet still you haven't the certainty of a real personal sense of God in your life. And you're still kind of trying to get at it. Now, why is that? remember a few Sundays ago we discovered one plain reason why many of us are in that position. Many of us think it's simply a case of believing it all and suddenly God makes himself real to you. And we have the same trouble as the young businessman that met Jesus. You, you remember he's described there in Luke 18. Luke 18 and Verses 18 to 23. And some of us have realized that the reason God isn't so real to us is we have the same problem as this young businessman. In verse 18, look 18 is page 912. 912. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these I have observed from my youth. And when Jesus heard it, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad. For he was very rich. Many of us are in that kind of position. You know. We don't realize that God will not make himself real to us unless we stop doing the things that our conscience tells us is wrong. And so we keep on pretending that we've stopped them, but we haven't really. Or we stop them all, but the ones that particularly come up against our own personal preferences. And so we're ready to obey God everywhere but where his will cuts across our personal preferences. And there we refuse to obey him. And because of that, uh, reconciliation with God is always an academic issue with us. It's always something that we go to listen to some man describing on Sunday, but it's never real in our own lives. Now I think, brothers and sisters, that's one reason why we said many of us do not enter into our real relationship with God at all. In other words, we never really repent. And so we're in the same position as Jesus described when he said, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You see, you can listen to this explanation Sunday after Sunday for years and years, 72, 73, 74, 86. I'm going to be still here 2010, I think, but up to the year 2010, you can listen to this and agree with it and think it's good, but unless you stop doing the things that God has told you destroyed his son Jesus, you'll never have any experience of God in your life. You know that we've said that. Many of us are trying to substitute intellectual belief for repentance. We're trying to substitute an intellectual assent to the fact that Jesus has died for our sins for actually stopping crucifying him in our own lives. 
Now, what I'd like to talk about this morning is another thing that we substitute intellectual belief for. Many of us are in the position this morning that we've listened to this for two years or more, and yet we still have no immediate sense of God in our lives, and we're in that position because we're trying to substitute intellectual belief for actual receiving of Jesus. Now, you'd see that clearly, the ones, if, if you just looked at the, the verse today, Romans 5 and 18. Romans 5 and 18. And it appears, you know, as many of Paul's verses in Romans appear to do, to repeat themselves. But God's word is so good and deep that he's always saying something different in the next verse. Romans 5 and 18 and page 981. Then as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. Now this won't fascinate you any more than it fascinated my wife when I told her, but many of us are in the problem, many of us are in this difficulty in our relationship with God because, and I hope all the Greek scholars will immediately say, yeah, yeah, you're right. And all those persons who don't know Greek will be like my wife. Because we don't understand the difference between the word dikaiosis and the word dikaioma. Okay? <laughs> we don't understand the difference because that's the word that's used in the New Testament, in, the, in that verse. We don't understand the difference between acquittal and reprieve. And many of us are in this position this morning where we have no real relationship of God, with God and no experience of him in our lives because we don't really see the difference between those two Greek words. We don't see the difference between reprieve and acquittal. Now, there is a difference. Reprieve, you see, according to the dictionary, is delaying or suspending a penalty. Just delaying it or suspending it. Acquittal is absolute removal of the penalty. It's completely pardoning the prisoner. Now, many of us are in this position where God is not real to us because we still think we're acquitted when we're simply living in a state of reprieve. I think it could explain it if you'll just be patient with me as I, I go through what happened at the beginning. You remember God made us because he wanted men and women to love and to share the fellowship that he had with his son Jesus. Because he wanted us to share that fellowship and to love him freely, he made us with free wills. He didn't make us people that were gentle and kind and loving. He didn't want a group of people who were gentle and kind and loving because he had made them so, because they couldn't be anything else. So he didn't make us gentle and kind and loving. He made us like himself with the same capacities as he had, but he made available to us the life that made him gentle, kind, and loving. That is the life of the Holy Spirit. And he gave us the free will to choose that life so that we would become like him or to reject it. You can see the reason for that. He didn't want a bunch of robots who were gentle, kind, and loving because they didn't know how to be unkind or unloving. He wanted a group of people that chose to be like him. And so he simply made that life of the Holy Spirit available to us. You remember in Genesis it's presented as the tree of life. And you know what happened. Adam and Eve decided to do, go it alone. They decided they would do without this life. They would do without this life of the Holy Spirit. They would use their own native wit and by experience of trial and error they would gather and collect a knowledge of good and evil. And so they decided to do it on their own. Now immediately God saw them doing that he knew that they would bring his universe into absolute disintegration. Because without the life of his Holy Spirit, they would become haters. They would become rebels. They would become people who consumed each other. And so he knew that if he let them go, they would soon disintegrate and pollute his universe completely. So he withdrew the infinite life and power of the Holy Spirit from them. And he condemned them to the helpless strivings that have resulted in our present international chaos and national chaos and personal chaos. Now, what was God's reaction to that? Well, let's not describe it 
uh, as it occurred in his great infinite mind. Because you can see that for God, the whole thing occurred in one moment. You know, he conceived the problem and the solution all at once. Let's take it as it's described in Genesis. What God's reaction was. Now, you look at Genesis 6 and 5 through 7, and you'll see his reaction. He saw that we men and women, without the life of his Holy Spirit, were about to bring the universe down around our ears. We were just about to destroy the whole thing. And he saw that Genesis 6, it's page 5, dear ones. Genesis 6 and verse 5. And God saw this. And he determined, of course, that he had to end the chaos and the corruption. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him to his heart. So he knew that as a God of order and a God of love, he was committed to destroying all disorder and all hatred. And so verse 7, So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the ground, man and beast and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. And God, as it's outlined in Genesis, obviously, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, the whole thing took place in one great moment in the infinite mind of God. But Genesis shows us that God saw the corruption and the chaos and resolved, the only thing I can do as a God of justice and holiness is to destroy this. Otherwise, it will overwhelm me and anything that I love or anything that I respect. And so God resolved to destroy the whole earth with a flood. Now then, you see, as Genesis described it, what he then saw, that he determined, in fact, never to do that again. Genesis 9 and verses 8 through 11. Genesis 9 and verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Now, how did this God of holiness and justice who was committed to punishing disorder and rebellion and sin, how was he able to determine never to destroy the earth again because he destroyed Jesus in its place, you remember. Jesus was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And God destroyed Jesus instead of destroying the earth. Now, do you see what God did? He gave the earth reprieve, brothers and sisters. He gave us a reprieve. He did not acquit us. He simply agreed to let us continue to exist. He didn't say, you're all okay because I've destroyed my son in your place. He said, you're back in the position that Adam and Eve were. You have the tree of life available to us. You have the tree of life there. You're back in their position. Now that's the state in which all of us have existed since that day. All of us have been in a state of reprieve. Mohammedans, Buddhists, skeptics, agnostics. The only reason all of us are still alive and God has not destroyed the whole place and wiped it out is because he destroyed Jesus in our place to give us a reprieve, to de delay or suspend the sentence of death upon us, to give us the opportunity to receive his life. But brothers and sisters, do you see, it is a state of reprieve. We are back in the position that Adam and Eve were in. But the only thing that will justify us in God's eyes is if we do what he asked Adam and Eve to do, eat of the tree of life. Now here's the position many of us are in, I think, here in the theater. We listen to that gospel and we say, you mean Jesus was crucified instead of us? then God has no longer anything against the world. That's right, he hasn't. And you say, well then, his arms are open to me. You're right, his arms are open to you. Well then, 72 is not on my back. You're right, 72 is not on your back. 
Anything that you have done in 72 has already been borne by Jesus. God has destroyed Jesus for those things that you did. You're right. You will never be rejected by God because of your sins. As far as God is concerned, he has suspended and delayed all judgment. But do you see, you still have to eat of the tree of life. Now, many of us are trying to substitute a belief in our reprieve for a receiving of the Holy Spirit that alone brings acquittal. You see, God can only really justify us. He can really only give us a sense that this is our right place on the earth. He can only give us a sense that he no longer rejects us, but that he accepts us and is fully pleased with us if we do what he put us on the earth to do originally, eat of the tree of life. Now what many of us are doing is, we're saying, oh, Jesus has died for us, so that judgment is suspended, so I don't need to eat of the tree of life. God justifies me because of Jesus' death. No, there's only one thing will justify you in God's eyes, and that is receiving of the tree of life into yourself. In other words, it is not a matter of simply believing that because of Jesus' death, we're all still alive. We're all still alive only for a temporary period to give us a second chance to eat of the tree of life. Now, do you see the difference, brothers and sisters? Many of us think, you see, Jesus has died, so all I have to do is repent and believe that. And God immediately acquits me. No, what you have to do is repent and then go back to the position Adam and Eve were all in and receive of the Holy Spirit of the tree of life. In other words, unless you receive Jesus into yourself, you will never experience justification with God. And you'll always find yourself trying to justify yourself in men's eyes by your grades, by your jobs, by your achievements, by your protests. Unless you actually eat of the tree of life, Unless you actually receive Jesus into your spirit by faith, you will never experience real justification with God. Now, do you see, brothers and sisters, the difference? I'd love to ask each one of you, you know, if you really understand it. But do you see, it's not enough simply to repent of your sins and to believe that Jesus has died for you. You have to repent, and Jesus' death brings you back into the Garden of Eden then you have to do what Adam and Eve were originally planned to do. You have to eat of the tree of life. You have to actually receive Jesus. That's why Jesus emphasized that, you see. Uh, John 1 and 12, you remember. Jesus emphasized that it's not just a question of, re of repenting, it's not just a question of believing, but it's actually a question of receiving. And it's page 922 and John 1 and 12. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power, or he gave the right, you remember, exousias, to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. But to all who received him. And the brothers and sisters, you get it emphasized in Revelation 3 and 20. It's that verse that a lot of us know off by heart. Revelation 3 and 20. And it's page 1074. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And this is the Spirit of Jesus speaking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Suppose I say it because so many of us are from an academic atmosphere. And so many of you might have lived in the purely intellectual sphere in which I lived for a long time in regard to God. And I think it's very easy, brothers and sisters, for you to see the sheer logic of the gospel, because it is very logical. And to see that you can't keep doing the things that crucify Jesus in your own life and expect them to deal with you. And so you, need to, you see the need for repentance and for stopping doing the things that your conscience tells you are wrong. 
But I think a lot of us tend to take the immediate step and say, ah, yes, well, Jesus has died for us, so we're acquitted. We don't need to do anything else. So we go off each Sunday with no dynamic power within us to make us different. Now, brothers and sisters, you're not justified by God unless you do what he put you on the earth originally to do, and that was to receive the life of his Holy Spirit from the tree of life, that is Jesus. In other words, you need to receive Jesus into yourself. I think that strikes at the pride of the academic, you see. certainly struck at the pride in me. I mean, I was prepared to change my life when I saw that that was needed, because morally you can see the sense in changing your life and improving it and becoming a better man or a better woman. But to actually do this business, you know, of into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and to actually go through what seemed a little childish exercise, that struck at my pride. Now, brothers and sisters, unless you receive the Spirit of Jesus into you by faith, God cannot justify you. And that's why many of you are still walking, trying to justify yourselves. You'll repent of your sins, you'll believe that Jesus died for you, but you won't receive Jesus by faith into yourself. And this is the last Sunday in 72. And I'm suggesting to you, if you have walked in an unsatisfying experience for a year, would you consider taking a step this morning on this business of receiving Jesus by faith? If you say to me, what is it like? I know it's not like feeling. It's not like emotion. You know, it's not that we sing an emotional hymn here and you try to feel the emotion of Jesus coming in. It's not a feeling. But you can see too, it's not an intellectual ascent to truth. Receiving Jesus is you personally taking a step and saying, Lord Jesus, can't see you, can't feel you, but I believe from what I've read in history that you are really God's son, that you really overcame death, and so you must be alive in this theater this morning. Lord Jesus, I ask you in whatever way you think is appropriate for me, will you come into my life and will you live inside me? Now, dear ones, unless you take that step, you will not be justified in God's eyes. And you'll find yourself continually being afraid of people and trying to justify yourself by doing the job well or getting a good grade or satisfying your relatives. But if you really do receive Jesus in by faith like that, whether you're feeling or not, you'll begin to find God giving you a sense of peace with himself. And you'll begin to sense that you are reconciled to God personally. Do you want to, is, is there any question anybody would want to ask just about that? Because I really feel for the men and women here who, who are trying to get into the thing intellectually, you know, but just can't make it and don't know what to do. Sister. How do you repent? You stop doing the things, sister. There's, that's the only answer. A lot of people say, oh, I cry, I try to feel sorry. I, no. You, I make resolutions. A lot of people say, I resolve. No, you stop doing the thing. If it's criticism, you stop criticizing. If you're selfish with your, your roommate, you stop being selfish. And you say to God that you're determined to stop it. And his Holy Spirit knows if you really mean it or not. That's it. You see, all of us think, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it, I want to do it. You can do it. If you really want to do it, the Holy Spirit will give you the grace to actually bring it about in your life. And so the Holy Spirit knows when a person is real and honest about their repentance. But the heart of it says, is repentance is metanoia in Greek, changing your mind, you stop doing the thing. Yeah. And, and Satan has persuaded us for years, you see, we can't do it. You can't do it. Your poor, weak things. The psychologists have brainwashed us with that. You can't stop it. You can't stop the problem, evade the problem. No, you can stop it. Yeah. And repentance is stopping it. If you're putting a sword into Jesus' side every time you criticize somebody, you stop it. You pull the sword out and you don't put it in again. Yeah. 
I know those are hard words, loved ones, but we, you know, we need more backbone. We need the backbone that God has given us. We've had it undermined for years, you see, and we've become soft in our attitudes to will. You know. And receiving Jesus, dear ones, you see, is, is just what I said. It's receiving by faith. If you ask me, had I any great feeling? No, I didn't. I had no great feeling, and I didn't walk down the aisle when they were singing just as I am. No, no. I just... I just said, Lord, I believe on the basis of the history in the New Testament that you're real, that you're God's son, that you blasted through death once. So as far as I'm concerned, by my own logic, you can come through any time. So you must be here today. Lord Jesus, I ask you now to come into my life, and I'm receiving you by faith. Yeah. And then, brothers and sisters, the miracle begins, you see. But until you take that step, no miracle can begin. You're purely an intellectual academic spectator until you take that step. And let us pray. Dear Father, those of us who know you would pray now for our brothers and sisters here this morning who are struggling with the intellectual problems and at times emotional problems and never really coming into a spiritual transaction with you. Lord Jesus, if you are real and from the historical evidence, we believe you are. We believe that you are different from Muhammad and Buddha because of the resurrection. Lord Jesus, if you are really God's son, we would want to receive you into our own lives this morning. Father, if you put us here on earth in order to eat of the tree of life, and you'll never be satisfied until we've done that, then we do that this morning by faith. Father, we know you don't ask us to do what we can't do. You don't ask us to do something that is impossible. But you do take us, ask us to take a step of faith and act on the basis of substantiating evidence. And we would do that this morning. Lord Jesus, we would ask you, as a spirit, to come into our spirits and to live inside us and be whatever you want to be in our lives. Father, we thank you that now not only have you nothing against us for our past, but you are pleased with us now and you accept us as your own children because your spirit of life is within us. We thank you for that. Trust you now for this coming year of 73. Trust you, Lord Jesus, to be able to be yourself in us. We trust you, Father, God, Creator, to be satisfied and pleased with lives that have order and meaning during these next 12 months. So we leave all that has passed behind. We forget those things that are behind. And now we look forward to this year to live it a day at a time for you to be victorious just for today so that at the end of 73 we'll look back on a year of victory because of the spirit that has come within us this day we commit ourselves to you now Father to use us for your purpose for your world and to bring order and sense into 